Uh, we are in the middle of a series. We're actually in part three of a series called Daddy Issues. And this series is all about the idea that our relationship with God is influenced by and ultimately sometimes we filter our relationship with God through our relationship with our earthly father. So if we have a great relationship with our earthly father, it helps us in some ways see God in a better light. But if we have a bad relationship or maybe no relationship with our earthly father, it can impact and influence our relationship with God and we may not even realize it. Um, It can influence us to see God in a way that's inaccurate because we filter that through the filter of our earthly father. And so what we've been doing through this series is just walking through what this looks like and what it means. Um, and, and, and the title of the series is called Daddy Issues, because I really do believe a lot of us have daddy issues that, that influence our relationship with our earthly, our heavenly father. And so what we want to do during this series is just really talk about what does is, what is God as our father look like? What does that really mean? I want to debunk some ideas maybe that you've got um, and, and so during week one, we talked a little about the prodigal son and that relationship, and that was a beautiful picture of our Heavenly Father. Last week, Pastor Ricky um, brought the Word of God to us, and he talked a little bit about um, what it means to be accepted by God and our identity in Christ and what that means and what that looks like, and he talked about some of his story. And so if you missed that, go back and catch up. And get, you need to hear that. Uh, and tonight, we want to continue that same thought. Uh, our key passage for the series is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and it starts in verse 14, and it says this, and this is Paul talking to the Corinthian church, he says, I do not write these things to make you ashamed, but to admonish you as my beloved children. For though you have countless guides in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For I became your father in Christ through the gospel. And another interpretation, another version of this scripture says, you have 10,000 teachers, or 10,000 tutors, but not many fathers. And this is a problem we see in the world we live in today, that there are are fathers, but they're not fathering their children. They have have done the the easy part, but they don't do the hard part. And in the, the spiritual world, it's clear to us that we need spiritual fathers. We need people who will... Uh, not just teach us, but help lead us and guide us and walk us through difficult situations. And that's what Paul says. He says, hey, you don't just need a teacher. You need somebody that can get in your life and help you with your junk because we all need that. And a lot of us do have baggage from our relationship with our earthly fathers that we carry into our relationship with our heavenly father. It it may be the fact that maybe your your dad was angry, and so we imagine God is an angry God. Uh, Maybe your dad was distant, so we imagine your God is a distant God, that he's not involved. Maybe, Maybe you had to earn your dad's affection, so you feel like you have to earn our heavenly father's affection. And all these things are lies from the enemy. They're not true at all, because our God is a good father. Um, One of the things I mentioned to you a couple weeks ago was a statement that we're going to expound on tonight. Um, We we see a couple times that that our Heavenly Father, God, spoke audibly so that people could hear it. And the two most prominent times are when when Jesus in Matthew chapter 17 is at the Mount of Transfiguration, and God speaks over him, and he said, this is my son whom I love, with whom I'm well pleased, and he adds the part, and he says, listen to him. It's pretty important, right? It's one thing to know what he's saying. It's another thing to be obedient to what he's saying. That's a whole another sermon series right there. Uh, listen to him. But he says almost the exact same thing at the, the baptism of Jesus. So when Jesus is baptized in water um, and he comes out of the water, John the Baptist brings him up out of the water and he gets up on the bank. Um, scripture tells us that the sky opens and a dove descends and the voice of God is heard audibly, and he said, um, this is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased, or with him I am well pleased, depending on the version you're reading. But this is in Matthew chapter 3, verse 17. And what God says is so important here. He, he makes these three statements. This is my son whom I love, with whom I am well pleased. And this first statement he makes, this is my son, is a really important statement. And this is what Pastor Ricky talked a little about last week. This is that identity portion. Well, who are you? Well, I'm a son of God. That's who I am. And this is what God says, no matter who you think this man is, this is my son. And this is so important for us to understand that our identity is found 
in Christ Jesus, that we are one with Christ. We are one with his suffering and his death and his resurrection. So we are co-heirs. We are seated with Christ in heavenly places. So we are his child. We are his son. We are his daughter. So we have to understand from the very get-go that our identity is found in him, but also, this is really important, that there is acceptance in God because of our identity. So it's not that it's not that God has to put up with you. Like, oh, well, it's my son. I guess I got to keep him around. But he accepts you because you are his son. He wants you around because you are his son or daughter. Does that make sense? There's acceptance. And, and, and gosh, psychologists will talk about all the issues that we have when we don't feel like we measure up to our father's expectations for our lives, especially with men, um, that we feel like we've got to measure up. We feel like we, we have to have the approval, the acceptance of our father. There's something deep inside us that longs for that. And I'm telling you, that is, that is something God has placed there, that there's a deep longing in each of us to be accepted by our heavenly father. And if we don't feel like we are, there's this emptiness in us. And I am here to tell you today, you are his son. You are his daughter. That's where your identity is. That's where your acceptance is found. So the first thing I want you to see is that you are accepted because you are his son or daughter. 1 John 3 verse 1 says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. That's who you are. That might not be <laughs> what you're... Uh, Credit history will tell you. That might not be what uh, your ex-boyfriend or girlfriend might say about you. That might not be what your boss says about you. But you know what? God calls you a child of God. That's how he sees you. That is your identity. And we can find acceptance in that. The next statement is so important. Whom I love. This is so important. This is the affection part. And this is where some of us get a little uncomfortable. I don't, I don't get uncomfortable with this. I, I like affection. I am the one, I'm going to hug. You know, if you're a handshaker or you don't, maybe don't even like handshakes, I'm going to be the one that wants to give you a hug. You know, I'm just, let's make it awkward. And maybe you like to hug, but you don't like a long hug. Let's make it awkward. Like, it doesn't count unless it's at least 10 seconds, right? Like, so we're just going to hug it out. One Mississippi to Mississippi. My, uh, my niece's husband, um, he is not a toucher. So I love to give him long, awkward, lingering hugs. We'll just hug it out. So he avoids me when he can. I like affection. And what we see is, and what you have to understand is, no matter what kind of affection your earthly father shows you, your heavenly father loves affection. He's going to do what we're talking through tonight. One of the things I understand about affection is um, we have to say it. It's not enough just to feel it. We have to say it. I heard a story once, and maybe you heard this story. There was a man and a woman that had been married for years, and the woman said to the man, why don't you ever tell me you love me anymore? He said, honey, I told you the day we got married, and if I, told, if I ever changed my mind, I would let you know. We're good, right? I told you then. I still feel the same way. Why would I need to tell you over and over and over like a crazy person? And some of us feel that way. We feel like, why would we need to tell people? They should know it, but they don't. So we tell them. It's important for us to communicate that verbally to the people around us. And I love this because in John chapter 15, verse 9, it says, As the Father has loved me, this is Jesus talking, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. So what he's saying is the same father, the love that the Father has uh, for me, he's got it for you. He's loving me in a way that I'm loving you. And this is powerful. Because nobody would dispute that Jesus was loved by God. But we would dispute that we're loved by God. We go, well, I'm, I'm a mess, and I've got a background, and I've been through a lot. And how could God love me? I know what I think about when nobody's around. I know how to respond. How could God love me? And I think we all can feel that way. But what I'm telling you tonight is God loves you. 
He is passionate about you. And you might be uncomfortable with affection, but our Heavenly Father is not uncomfortable with affection. He will tell you over and over and over and over again how crazy about you that he is. In fact, it says in Scripture, in Psalm 139, that the thoughts of the Father about us are more numerous than the sand on the beach. He can't get you off his mind. He thinks about you constantly. That's how he loves us. George Bernard Shaw said this, the single, single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that it has taken place. I talk to leaders about this a lot, that we can over-communicate vision. If we're leading a church or leading a, a business or leading a, a department, whatever it is, we continually communicate vision because we think we over-communicate it, but we do not. We don't say it enough that people don't get it. And I've said this before. If people can't mock you about what you're saying without you being around, if they don't get it so deeply that they can make fun of you a little bit for it, then they don't get it. And, and this, is, this is true over and over and over in our lives. We see this over and over. I say to my wife, um, honey, I love you. And that's pretty normal for us. But it was funny, the first time I ever told her I loved her, and she can vouch for this, first time I told her. I'd never told, I'd never told a woman I was not related to that I'd loved her before. I never said it on a date, never told some girl I was going out, never, never said it. I had, I had that awkward moment when a girl would tell me, I love you, thank you. <laughs> that is not what they're looking for, by the way. But I was not gonna say it unless I meant it, and when I met Kim Massingale, Kim Franklin at the time, I meant it. But I'd never said it before, and so I told her, I love you. I said, I've never told a girl that before, so I might not tell you that very often because I'm not used to it. But what I realized is that that wasn't something I had to make myself do because it was something that came out of who I was. I felt deeply about it, so it was easy to tell her I loved her. I tell my girls all the time that I love them. In fact, I tell them so often, when Emma was a little younger, she would get frustrated with me for telling her how much I loved her. I'd say, baby, I, have I told you that I love you? Daddy! You tell me all the time, right? Like, it's ridiculous how you tell me you love me. It was almost frustrating to her that I would tell her so often how much I loved her. But I understand something very keenly that if I'm not communicating it verbally, it may not be meeting the mark. It may not be getting home. Another group of people that I say <laughs> that I love regularly at the end of every single service I preach, I get made fun of now for it. But the joke's on you, suckas, <laughs> because it is in your brains now. Pastor appreciation cards started coming my way, and thank you so much again for all the pastor appreciation cards. I can't even tell you how many said at the very end of the card, I love you more than you know, and I'm so glad that you're my pastor. <laughs> and every single time, mmm. Right? You're making fun of me a little bit, but I'm in your head. <laughs> because what you understand, whether you really get it or not, you have heard me say over and over and over and over and over, I love you more than you know. So if you forget everything I say tonight, if you come to this church enough, you're going to hear me say regularly, I love you more than you know. And what you have to understand is it's not enough to love someone. We have to communicate that verbally. We have to tell them how we feel. Because if we don't, it's not really hitting the mark. And what we see in Scripture is the Word of God from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation, is a love letter from our Heavenly Father that he says over and over and over and over and over and over again, I love you more than you know. I'm so grateful for that. He doesn't hold back communicating to us how much he loves us, how passionate it is he is for us, and what he would do for us. So we have to say it. The second thing is we have to do it. So it's not enough to say I love you, because if our words and our actions aren't in alignment, then our words are empty and meaningless. So we have to do it. We have to show how we love. Now, I'm going to talk just a little bit tonight about what we do to show our love, but this is not an exhaustive list. 
This is, honestly, I was sitting with my girls this week, and I said, hey, let's talk about this. This is an honest question. Daddy needs some help with his sermon. Um, and uh, so t- help me out. How do you know that I love you? Well, you tell me. No, 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 no. We're not talking about that. If I never told you I loved you, how would you know that I loved you? And so they started answering this question for me, and we started talking through it. And what I realized is, is there are ways that we see our Heavenly Father loves us if we're paying attention. The first thing we see is that a loving father is faithful to his children. Deuteronomy chapter 7 verse 9 says, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps his covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Now during the month of May, we were in a series on the book of Ruth. And in that series, we talked a lot about covenant. And we talked a lot about steadfast love. That covenant relationship is different than a contract. And that, that, that steadfast love is that chesed love that, uh, that is different than any kind of love we really understand. And what we see here is are those exact same words. That God, he keeps his covenant. He loves us with a chesed love. That at the end of the day, we know he loves us because he is faithful. See, a faithful father will show his love to his children through his faithfulness. Um, I think a faithful father knows his children, who they are, what they love, what they're passionate about, what they care about. Matthew chapter 6 verse 8 says, talking about how to pray, and Jesus says, don't be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. See, our Heavenly Father knows us so well and so intimately that he knows what we need before we realize what we need. I don't know that I know anybody that well, but our Heavenly Father knows us that well. He knows you that well. Before you even ask, before you even recognize the need, he recognizes it for you. That's how he knows you. See, a loving father is faithful to provide for his kids. It's easy to to say, well, of course, that's a no-brainer. In the generation that my dad grew up in, my dad was a little bit of an anomaly. I told you before, he's a, you think I'm a crybaby. I get it. I come by it naturally. My dad is a crybaby. I mean, he is a softy. You wouldn't think about looking at him. He's a big man, but man, he's he's a softy. He'll cry. He'll give me hugs and kisses. I mean, that's just who he is. Um, But that was not normal in that generation. And especially in the previous generation before that, a lot of times men would would say things like, well, you know I love you, I provide for you. I put a roof over your head, I put food on the table, right? And yes, those are signs of love. But if that's all it is, then it's incomplete. So a good father, a loving father, will provide for their children, not just the material needs, but the emotional, the spiritual needs as well. See, a loving father will not just leave it to a kid's pastor or a youth pastor to, and hope their kids get to heaven someday, but a loving father will take responsibility for the spiritual welfare of their children and say, no, 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 I'm the minister of my home. It got real quiet. You guys, were, you guys liked this message when I was telling jokes. When I get to this part, you're like, oh, go back to the jokes, Mel, right? See, a loving father is responsible to be faithful to know what the emotional needs of his children are, so he can provide for them, come alongside them, meet those needs. What we see is our Heavenly Father, he is a radical provider for us. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 26, he says, Jesus says, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap or gather into barns, yet your Heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than they? He said, hey, the birds got all they need. Everything they need is taken care of because... The Heavenly Father sees them, and he says, if these birds have all they need, why don't you have all you need? Of course you'll have all you need. What he's saying is, our Heavenly Father's a provider. He's going to take care of everything you need. That's who he is. That's what he does. And it's hard to see that in times when we are in lack, when we don't feel like we have enough, when we don't have enough security, when we feel emotionally insecure, when we feel like there's insecurity in relationships, when we feel like we don't have enough finances, all the areas of our life where we need things, we can feel a lack and we go, God, are you really a provider? And what we have to remind ourselves over and over and over and over again is a loving father provides for his children. 
And our God is a loving provider. He's a loving God. He will take care of us. Another thing that we don't talk about much, but a loving father is faithful to his children through correction. Again, I knew this part wouldn't be exciting for you. You'd be like, yeah, preach on correction some, right? (laughs) We don't like correction. None of us do. We don't like it from our parents. I'm 41 years old, and I still don't like to be in conflict with my parents. Or if they go, I don't know, you know, because our relationship has shifted, but I'm still their baby boy. Does anybody else know what I'm talking about? We don't like to be corrected by our boss. So we reject things like that. We go, oh, they're out to get us. If we correct someone, it must mean we don't like them. But that is not the case at all. What we see in Scripture is a loving father will correct his kids. In fact, if you don't correct your kids, it indicates that you're not a loving parent. That's what Scripture says. And so what our Heavenly Father does, he's, he will gently correct us. I've talked about this before. Um, I don't know how we got around before GPSs. Maps. Does anybody remember Maps. You'd have maps in your car, and you're like, I don't even know, right? Try to figure, where am I at? I don't even know where I'm at. And you're like, uh, GPS, it's, we're ruined now. If I don't have my GPS, I have no clue where I'm going. So we're, we're driving along, and the GPS, if the GPS tells you you've made a wrong turn, you just follow the GPS. There's been a few times I have not, and I've regretted it later. So you follow the voice of the GPS. And if it's British, it sounds so much smarter, doesn't it? You're like, oh, well, now I can, I can trust my GPS because it's British, so we're good. But nobody gets angry at your GPS when it says, at the next intersection, make a U-turn. Correcting, correcting. Who do you think you are, British robot trying to tell me what to do? No. See, we understand correction in some areas of our lives, but we don't in other areas of our lives. And what we have to understand is a loving father is faithful to correct his children. And really what we have to understand is if you fail to correct well, you fail to love well. Second thing is a loving father is patient with his children. I didn't say I am always patient with my children, by the way. I said a loving father is In Psalm 86, verse 15, in the Passion Translation, it says, But Lord, your nurturing love is tender and gentle. You are slow to get angry, yet so swift to show your faithful love. You are full of abounding grace and truth. Your nurturing love is tender and gentle. You're slow to get angry, yet so swift to show your faithful love. Uh, My wife and I, we lived with her parents. How long did we live with your parents? Six months. Felt like like 10 years. <laughs> Six months. Okay. So we, we were building a house, and I love my, my in-laws. My wife's parents are fantastic. I love them. Um, and so we decided, hey, we're going to move in with her parents while we're building a house in, in the Fort Worth area of Texas. And so we're going to build this house, and we'll save money and live with her parents. And it'll be great because they had two extra bedrooms. And, and so we'll be in one, and our two small children will be in the other one. And, uh, and Abby was probably... I don't know, four, five maybe, and Emma was still in a baby bed. And so this is going to work out perfect. And not long before we moved in with her parents, her younger sister, who was a single mom, moved back in with her parents. So we went to the single bedroom with four people in the bedroom. And it was so frustrating because have you ever tried to get a a baby to sleep and then... (laughs) It's like you get the baby in bed and you like put her down. It's like Indiana Jones, you know, in the Raiders of the Lost Ark when he's trying to move the idol and he's like, uh, doesn't want to set off the booby trap. That's what it feels like when you're putting an infant to bed. It's like you're trembling, just like, please no, don't make noise, you know, like just walk away slowly. And the problem is, is if you've got a toddler in the room with that child you're trying to put to sleep. And so we spent about six months without a good night of sleep. And it was just oh, so frustrating because Abby would be loud, and she hasn't changed that much. She's still loud a lot of times. And so she would be loud and be like, just shut up, like be quiet, and your sister's trying to sleep. And so she might get to sleep, but there would be times in the middle of the night I'd wake up. And so we had a queen-size bed and a little toddler bed and a baby bed all in this room. So there's no room for anything else. But I would be asleep, and I would hear a noise, thump, 
thump, and I would open my eyes, and little Emma, she, she was addicted to pacifiers when she was a baby, and so she had passies all over her bed, but she decided in the middle of the night, I want sister to be awake, so she would, I would wake up and find her throwing passies at her sister, throwing them, like trying to wake her up, like thump, and I'd be like, oh, you people are trying to ruin my life, all right? I was not the most patient person in the world. I was frustrated. I was tired. I just wanted them to sleep for five minutes, right? So it's easy to say, be patient. It's another thing to be patient. As I've gotten older, it's easier to be patient because I've got the benefit of hindsight. I've got the benefit of perspective. But when I was younger, a young father, it was so easy to get impatient with my children. Maybe you had a dad that was impatient with you. But I'm telling you today, our Heavenly Father's not impatient with you. He's not flying off the handle. You don't have to walk around in eggshells around him. He's slow to get angry and yet so swift to show his faithful love. A loving father will be close to his children. Um, I think both emotionally and physically. See, Jesus touched people to see them healed constantly. He would touch their eyes or touch their leg. Um, He made physical contact with people even though he didn't have to. And the reason is, is because I think he felt like it was important for him to be in contact, in physical connection with them. Because he could have spoken the word and had them healed. He did that before, but he didn't do that most of the time. He he would go to where they were and lay his hands on them. And, And there's something powerful about touch, We see it medically. We see infants. Uh, This wasn't like this when our girls were newborns, but now they want to get the newborn skin-to-skin contact is really important for newborns now. And so you see this in uh, in labor and delivery units all over the country that they want to get right on the mom's chest, skin-to-skin contact, because there's something powerful about touch. There's something powerful about that proximity, being in close contact and relationship. And what we see is Jesus would touch people physically, and it produced something spiritually. Because there was a transference of some sort that would happen. And I'm telling you today, we can downplay the, the, the value of physical touch, but it is so important in our lives. So you might be somebody who you do not want to hug. You, you want to maybe handshake, but even that, you want to make it real brief because you don't like the germs or whatever it is. By the way, we got Purell out in the lobby just for you, okay? I'm telling you something powerful happens when we're in contact with each other. In Hebrews chapter 6, the writer of Hebrews says this in verse 1. He says, therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God and of instruction about washing, he's talking about baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. So what he's talking about in the, in the Hebrews is he's talking, the writer of Hebrews is talking to believers and he, before this, he gets on to him and he says, really, you shouldn't be this immature. You should be more mature than this. Some of you should be teaching by now, but you're still infants. You should be eating meat, but you're still on milk. And so he's, he's getting on to them, and then he says this, and he says, hey, we shouldn't have to go back to these elementary teachings. And what are the elementary teachings? Well, repentance from dead works, so repentance from sin, that if we're living in sin, we turn away from that. We repent and go the opposite direction. The instruction about baptism, that baptism's important, water baptism. And he says the laying out of hands and then the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. So we're talking about going to heaven someday, and the, So eternal reward or eternal punishment, heaven or hell. But right in there is the laying on of hands. And for some of you, maybe you came from a church background where it was not normal to lay hands on people. But for us, we have a prayer team at the end of the service that they stand on the side of the stage and they will pray for you. And they don't like say, hey, can I pray for you? Okay, and they step away from you. A lot of times they'll say, hey, do you you care if I put a hand on your shoulder? Can I, is that okay? And they'll put a hand on your shoulder. And there's something powerful about that. Because what scripture 
is clear on, and what I think we understand intuitively to some level or another, is that there is a transference that happens. There's something that only happens when we come into contact with each other. There's a, there's a, a relationship that's built. There's something that happens in the spirit between one person and another when we're in contact with each other. And so if we're unwilling to be in contact with our kids, to bring them close, then there is something that's not being transferred. There's something that's not being transmitted to them because we're not in contact with them. And I'm telling you, I'm a physical touch. Like, I like having my girls on my lap, and I like hugs. That's who I am. But I'm telling you tonight, our God is a near God. He is a close God. He is a God that wants to pull you up close to him. He wants you to feel his touch. He wants you to experience the intimacy of being with him. That is who he is. Proximity is a major factor in intimacy. That's why whenever somebody comes to our church and I meet them and we're talking and where do you live? And they, oh, we live in Dubois. Oh, wow, that's a long drive. Yeah, but we love this church. Well, that's great that you love this church. Let me help you find a church that's closer. No, 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 we like this church. That's fine, but I'm telling you, it's gonna be hard for you to be in intimate relationships if all you can do is get here on Sundays. And so I try to help them find a church that's closer to them because of this idea that proximity is a factor in intimacy. The closer we are to somebody, the easier it is to build a relationship with them. You don't believe me, think about some of the people you work with. Would you ever be friends with them normally? No, but you're with them every single day, right? You build relationship, camaraderie because of, of, of closeness, of proximity. And I'm telling you, God is a God that is close to us. He is a good father. He's a faithful father. He's a loving father. So he brings us close. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13, it says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. See, God doesn't keep us at arm's distance. He brings us in close to where he is. He wants us to feel that intimacy, that closeness. See, we know that we are loved because God is a faithful God, and he has brought us near to him. And the last thing I'll mention to you tonight, the loving father sacrifices for his children. <laughs> loving father sacrifices time. Holy cow. How much time? Do we give to our kids? Isn't it crazy? Money? You don't even want to count up how much money you've invested in your children, even if they're tiny, maybe especially if they're tiny. You remember when your kids were born and you had stacks of diapers and you felt like it might as well be gold? That's how much it cost? Like, oh my gosh. It's not even counting college. Good Lord, what are we going to do here? I remember before I got married, I thought, man, I'm broke. I don't got no money at all. And I got married, and I was like, oh, now I'm broke, <laughs> right? And then we had kids, and we were like, oh, yeah, now we're broke. Yeah, that's what this is like. Because they require sacrifice. <laughs> my girls, one of the things my girls said when I said, how do you know that I love you? One of the things they both said was, um, you'll dance like a ballerina for us. <laughs> you will never see that, by the way. <laughs> but I really believe one of the things that, that a good, a loving father will sacrifice his pride. He will lay down his pride for his kids. He will do things he normally wouldn't do for his kids. We'll invest in things financially that we normally wouldn't invest in. We'll love the things that they love. Um, I've said this before. Would anybody willingly go to a junior high band concert on their own? No. Of course not. If you met somebody at a junior high band concert and you're like, oh, what grade your kids in? And they said, oh, I'm just here to watch the band. <laughs> what in the world? Like, this person needs to be arrested right now. Something is wrong with them, right? And my youngest daughter, Emma, is in dance. Uh, and a number of parents in this church, are, their kids are involved in the Sue Hewitt uh, Dance School here in town. And they had their, their recital last week. And... You have to love your kids to go to the Sue Hewitt dance recital because there are 48 dances, and my child was in three. You have to love your child to go and endure that, right? That is a sacrifice. But we do it because we love our kids. I'm telling you today, our Heavenly Father loves you so much he sacrificed for you. 1 John 4, 7 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. 
So it's not that he can love or loves with a, as a verb, but he is love as a noun. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. So what this is saying is the way God shows his love, the way he, he does it, if I can say it this way, is that he sent his son as manifest love for us. He proves it by saying, I'm going to sacrifice my own son for these people that don't even love me yet. One of my favorite passages is Romans 5.8, and it says, God shows his love for us in this, while we are yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God sent his son when we were at our worst, when we didn't even love him. Scripture tells us that we were, we were enemies to the cross. That's who he is. John 3.16 is probably the most quoted scripture in the history of the human race. Even unbelievers can quote it. You will see it held on signs at football games. It just says this, for God so loved the world, he gave. The loving father will sacrifice for his kids because he loves them. I'm telling you tonight, your heavenly father loves you so much, he has given you everything. That's who he is. Um, I was a little hesitant to do this. I got permission, though. So this last week, uh, one night, I was sitting on the couch, relaxing, um, resting, watching some television, and Emma, my 12-year-old, came downstairs, and she had a number of items in her hand, and I thought, well, I wonder what she's doing. She came in, she was a little upset, and I said, baby, what's going on? And she had some of her favorite items, some that were very sentimental to her, had stuff on them. And I was like, what is that? And if you are a parent with kids, like small kids, or maybe preteens, maybe you understand the fad that hopefully has died out by now the, of slime. Has anybody had to let your kids make slime? If you don't know what it is, be grateful. Uh, so Emma, she used to love to make slime, and she had a tub of slime, an old tub of slime that she'd left on this chair. It was a fuzzy chair that her, grand, or her, her nana had bought her, and it was in her bedroom. And on that chair, this fuzzy blue chair, was a pillow that a family friend had gotten her that said hope real big. It was cutesy, had a fringe, all this kind of stuff on it. And also on this chair sat her favorite, I think it's the only stuffed animal she still has, uh, but it, it was from when she was little. She got it when she was two or three, but it's got sentimental value. And she brings all these down because there was a tub of slime that had gotten open somehow and had gotten all over this stuff. And it was, it was dried. It was, it was hard. And I see this and I just go, baby, I don't know what to tell you. And she was upset. I said, ah. I don't know, we might, have, we, we might have to throw this stuff away, baby, I don't know. Daddy, I don't know, can't we, I don't know. Right, she was upset. Okay, okay, daddy's got this. And I thought, I don't know if I got this. So I, I Googled, because thank God for Google, right? If you pray and God doesn't give you the answers, Google it. Um, so <laughs> I'm kidding. So I Googled, how do you get slime out of anything and started going through the list, and by the way, the answer is vinegar, so everything will smell awesome afterwards. So, um, so man, I started combing this dried slime out of this chair, and I, you know, just trying to do my best, and I got the vinegar out, and three hours later, like 11.30 at night, I'm like, okay, I think I'm done. I think we're in pretty good shape, and I had to cut some of the stuff out, and it's terrible. But I can tell you the whole time, I wasn't thinking, man, I love my daughter so much. I was thinking, she's going to owe me so big. <laughs> so I'd love to tell you my heart was righteous, and I was, oh, I will take care of that, my daughter. Bring your needs unto me, and I will, no, no. I was like, ah, all right, 
In fact, I told her, just throw the pillow away. We're not going to be able to get it. And once I saw how it was going, I was like, okay. And I got the pillow out of the trash. And so we got done and we finished it up. The next day, she comes downstairs and she had gone to bed before I did. She came, comes downstairs the next morning and she brings me this card. And I asked her permission if I could read it. And uh, so she acquiesced. It says, Dear Daddy, I absolutely love you more than anyone in the whole wide world. Besides mama. <laughs> you two are equal. I'm sorry. I spilled my slime and got it in my, on my chair, teddy bear, and pillow. I thought you'd be very upset with me, so I was hesitant to tell you, but I knew you'd find out sooner or later. Thank you for not getting on to me about it and helping me. I can't explain how thankful I am. Thank you for taking all that time to fix the mess that I made. Most dads would not do that, but you did, and for that, you are the best daddy in the world. Thank you for not giving up on my hope pillow, which is kind of ironic. Because <laughs> we did give up hope. We threw it in the trash. <laughs> Thank you so much for last night and every day. You're an amazing daddy every day. You always do so much for me, always make me laugh, smile, and always make me feel loved. So does mama. You both love Abby and I no matter what and always encourage us. Thank you. I'm sorry I don't always show how much I love and appreciate you and Mama. I love you, uh, though, so much, and I'm so thankful for you guys. Thank you for last night and every day. I love you, Emma. Now, this is, um, I was hesitant to read it because I didn't want to read this and have you think I'm going, yay me, because I'm such a good dad. That, that's not it at all. Uh, I've tricked my daughters, okay? That's what it is. Uh, they see me in a light, which is great. I'm thankful for that. I am not the world's best dad, but, but the reason I wanted to share that with you tonight is this. What struck me about this card wasn't how great I am. Like, oh, she, she recognizes how great I am. What struck me about this card is the fact that she was mature enough to recognize, hey, my dad helped me out. See, an immature child would go, yeah, I deserve that. But my child's old enough to go, you know what, you, you do a lot for me, thanks. And that's what struck me. Because as I started thinking about it, this card is one we could just as easily write to our Heavenly Father. Hey, thanks for not going hard on me. Thanks for when I blew it, you showed me kindness instead of anger. Hey, thank you for when I made the mess, you cleaned it up. Hey, thank you for taking care of me. And I'm sorry for, for not always telling you how much I love you and how, how much I care about you and how grateful I am for you. And I'll be quite honest with you. When I read this, I was a little convicted because I thought, when was the last time I had this conversation with God? <laughs> Thanks for cleaning up my messes. Thanks for loving me even when I blow it. And this is my challenge to you tonight. Number one, I want you to remember this week. I want you to live out this week your life with the knowledge that God loves you passionately because it can change everything for you. God loves you not in the way your earthly father loves you. He loves you better. No matter how good your dad was, our heavenly father is better. He loves you more. See, that should give us an assurance throughout the week, a confidence throughout the week, uh, a, a certainty throughout the week that he's faithful, he's patient, he's close, and he will sacrifice for us. And the second thing I want you to do is I want you, in just a minute, we're going to worship together. I want you to worship God this way. I want you to say, God, thank you for being so good to me. Thank you for loving me when I really didn't deserve it. Thank you for cleaning up my messes. Thank you for all you, God, I'm sorry that I don't tell you enough. That's my challenge to you guys tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you've never really experienced the love of God. I want you to know tonight's a great night to experience that. I want to give you an opportunity in just a moment to make Jesus Lord of your life, to experience what it means to be adopted into the family of God, become a, a co-heir with Christ. And I'm not going to embarrass you or make you come forward. I'm just going to pray with you. I want to give you that opportunity. So if you would bow your head and close your eyes all over this room. And if you're here tonight and you say, Mel, that's me. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life. I want to experience what it's like to be a son or daughter of God. I'm not going to make you come forward. I just want to ask you to raise your hand real high where I can see it. 
And you can put it right back down. I'm just going to pray with you. Is there any tonight? You'd say, that's me. Pray for me, man. I want to make Jesus Lord of my life tonight. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Mel, you know what, I, I, I'm a Christian, I'm going to heaven, but the truth is, I don't always live my life with that awareness of how loved I am by God, and I, I need to be reminded of that. I, I just need the Holy Spirit to remind me daily how much God loves me. If you would, raise your hand real high and I'll pray with you. Yeah, yeah, lots of hands. Let me pray for you. Lord, we love you, and we're so grateful that you love us. I pray that for those that raise their hand tonight, and Lord, those that are watching online that are responding, God, I pray that your Holy Spirit would make us keenly aware this week of how loved we are by you. That no matter what our relationship with our earthly father looks like, we are loved desperately and passionately by our heavenly father. And God, I pray that it would shift and change everything in our lives, God. I pray that we would recognize how faithful you are. We would recognize how close you are. We would recognize um, what you want to do in our lives. And I pray that as we recognize that, as the Holy Spirit opens our eyes to that, Lord, I pray that it would shift everything in us, God. I pray that we would live our lives with a confidence and with a boldness, knowing that we are your son or daughter that we are loved deeply by you. So God, I pray you'd have your way with us tonight. I pray that your love would come alive in us like never before. I pray that it would change us, but it would change those around us as well. So God, have your way among us tonight. Be glorified in your name we pray, amen. Here's what's gonna happen now. Our prayer team is gonna make their way forward as we begin to sing. And while we're singing, Uh, We're going to worship God together. We're going to go after the Lord. And if you need prayer for any reason at all, our prayer team will be available to pray with you. And uh, they they may even put a hand on your shoulder. So I'm just warning you. Uh, But they're going to agree with you in prayer. And I believe that prayer changes things. So if you have any need at all, find one of our prayer team members. Uh, And then in just a moment, we're going to finish singing. And when we do, uh, my wife, uh, Pastor Kim, is going to come. And she's going to close us out and dismiss us in just a moment. But I want to encourage you to stand to your feet. We're going to worship together one more time. Uh, this evening and while we're worshiping go ahead you can stand it's all right while we're worshiping tonight I just want to remind you let's pray and let's worship and just thank God for who he is what he's done for us that uh, that he cleans up our messes even when he didn't make them we did guys I tell you every week I love you more than you know and I hope you know that I mean that sincerely guys love you God bless you have a happy Father's Day we'll see you next weekend